Hello, welcome back to Hear Our Voices. This is your host, Kay Did. And right now we have on Asia. And we're going to hear her story today. She's one a person who's in the shelter right now. And she's going to tell you how her experience is. So can you tell us a little bit before you went to the shelter that you're in now, a little bit about your shelter experience before this? Okay, so I have um, two separate ones. Um, first, I entered as a single person. And then the second time was as a parent with my son when he was about, when he was first born, about maybe two months old. And can you tell us a little bit how was it to be a single person in a shelter and what differ from Pat? And tell us a little bit about Pat. Okay, so um, as a single person, you don't enter through Pat. You would enter through, um, actually, you would just go directly to a site, like in Brooklyn, where I went to um, help you with stay on Williams Street, on Williams Avenue, sorry. Um, now, as a parent, um, you go to PATH, um, and pretty much the process is you have to do your intake. Um, they ask you, you know, the reasons why you're entering shelter, if you have any, um, you know, anywhere you could stay, someone who would, if they were to pay, allow you to stay until you find a more permanent place. Um, I mean, depending on the situation, if it's eviction, you know, it would be an automatic eligibility, but for DV, you would have to be found um, eligible, NOVA eligible, which is no violence again. For me, it was just a um, disagreement with my son's father, as you know, that led me to um, going to shelter. So um, I pretty much just provided my address history and they verified it. Um, they couldn't force me to stay there because it was a NYCHA apartment and they have rules against that. So I was able to um, stay in shelter and receive placement. You said they have rules against what exactly? Um, okay, so for NYCHA, yeah. as far as that goes, um, you're not allowed to move anyone into your residence without approval, they would have to apply or be put on to your lease. Um, so if I was, so when I went to PATH and I told them like, you know, I was residing at this address and they verified it was a NYCHA apartment, they couldn't tell NYCHA that I had to stay there or that I have accommodations, you know, available to me because it wasn't my apartment. I got it. I understand. I know what you mean. And I don't, I do know about that rule. They're very strict on it, it seems like, too, because <laughs> I'm in nature. Yeah. And yeah. they're very strict on that information. So, going into PATH, can you tell us how you, like, how are you feeling? Did it feel like you have to be, you had, like, no other way out? Like, your well, current situation? To be honest, I, okay, so. A little backstory, like I do backwards, I do work, you know, as well in shelter. So I used to hear from clients, like how stressful and, and um, how stressful it was for them, um, how they felt that, you know, a lot of the workers and the people that work there, although sidebar, they may be in the same situation as us, but not saying it, you know, treated them with such disrespect and they looked down on them. And these are other people of color, you know? Right. So it was frustrating for some people and it, you know, it, it, it tugs at your self-esteem a little bit, you know, because you, you begin to question yourself. Um, so for me, it was a, even more of a struggle because like I said, I do work there, um, work, you know, subcontracted under DHS as a case manager. And then also I find myself in a situation where, you know, I have to be in the system as well now to, you know, make a way, find a way for myself and my son. Um, so it was stressful, you know, it was hard to deal with. I felt ashamed at some point. And at the same time, I felt empowered because I know the system and I know that um, 
I have a little bit of an advantage and they wouldn't be able to just push me around like I'm a number. I understand what you mean. So, on that day of pack, when you walk in through the security guard area, when you get, like, you know, put your stuff through, and you go upstairs okay. and stuff like that, yeah. how did that feel to you? Um, It was frustrating. It was upsetting, because when you enter PATH, uh, they have, you know, security, like any other government building. Um, And the thing about PATH is that, well, now for during corona, it's a little different. So let's talk about pre-corona because corona is not really changing that much. So um, you cannot bring any food in the building, okay? So imagine having children under a certain age who need snacks, who need to, you know. So that was hard. Um, yes, they search your bag, you know, and then you go upstairs and, well, you go to the, you go to the front desk, you fill out the paper. You know, then you go upstairs and you sit in the big room with everybody in their bags and their kids running around on the floor crying. It, you know, so that puts you in a place like, oh, I had to deal with this now. Um, so that's all oh, no, it's frustrating. And you sometimes you're there from early in the morning to late at night. And then you have to go back because they haven't placed you or they gave you temporary placement to come back and finish an application. Um so I know for this last experience I had when I was there, my son was hungry and I had to go outside and I literally had to bring him inside and have him eat his, his Happy Meal on the floor in the, in the lobby because they wouldn't let us go upstairs even during Corona with, um, with the food. Um, oh, wow. So it was upsetting. Because, yeah, it was upsetting because, you know, he's, he was at the, I mean, he was two at the time. He's still, he's going to be three in, in a couple of weeks. But he's two, so he doesn't know any better. You know, and all he knows is he wants to eat and he eats at a table with a chair, you know, and he didn't want to eat. So the food had to go in the garbage, but he was still hungry because he refused to eat standing up, you know what I'm saying? Or sitting down on the floor in the lobby. I'm surprised. Um, but I knew it was usually for kids. When I, my daughter was like two, I was able to bring food because it was for her. I would say like literally it's for her and they'll let me in. But probably with Corona is much different because we're just like, I left the shelter. I was in there for a year. I left in 2018. And I okay. was in there probably 2000 and I guess 16 about. Mm -hmm. So I'm surprised. I'm shocked they didn't let you in there with the like baby eating. Not like you, you're eating as a, a child eating. They don't know okay, the so difference of what's going my on. Son, you know? No, you're right. Because um when when I like I said, when I went with my son, when my son was an infant, they didn't do anything about that because um you know, bottles, the hot water, the thermos, all of that, you could go inside with it. That's a, like a no, you know. Um, but my son is two, but he's the size of a three-year-old, probably almost the size of a four-year-old. So they probably looked at him and was like, oh, this is a big kid, but not knowing that he's only two. You know what I'm saying? So they probably felt that he was old enough to wait, you know, in their eyes. Um, so I kind of, I understand, like I said, I work in the system, so I kind of get it. But at the same time, I feel, I still feel that certain steps, certain things are just a little inhumane. I it needs to be changed. At the, you know? I don't, I don't get it. I'm sorry. If you're asking these people who are going through this traumatic ordeal to come to PATH with their children under 18 or, you know, whatever they have, I feel like they should make a way to even get, like I was telling somebody yesterday, to get a contract with McDonald's or something, because McDonald's is the closest, like, you know, biggest kind it's of right restaurant. right there, one block away, right around, I'm sure people go there anyway, they leave there and go right to McDonald's and come right back. Exactly. They I mean, the thing is that they do like, provide. even kids getting kids meal or something like that, because kids don't right. want that nasty food they're giving them. It doesn't make any sense. Kids I don't want to say. Food. That's, that, that's, first of all, that's the city lunch, like, lunch school. Lunch, exactly. Lunch school lunch um and if i wasn't eating free free as a kid why do you think it's a grown exactly. adult that i want to eat free free i'm not doing it exactly. i'm sorry as a grown exactly. adult i'm not eating free free and i don't care if you feel that in my situation i'm supposed to take anything that's, that's the, the problem. problem that that's is the, the exact problem. problem with their attitude and their perception of what it is and i always tell people i mean even my pd all the way down um i tell them all the time you're one situation away from being in those shoes. You understand what I'm saying? Exactly. So I'm going to need you to humble yourself before you have to be humble. Exactly. That is so true. 
So I want to ask how it is in the shelter for you right now, like going, because you've been through the shelter system. Was it different walking into a shelter this time? And did you get denied? Did they say, I got denied a few times when I was going to the shelter. Did you get denied? If you did, how was that experience? And how was it going through the first day of shelter? Um, well, going back the second time was a little harder for me only because as a woman and a mom, um, I could have made better decisions. Um, I should not have left the first time, in my opinion. I should have stuck it out and not and believed who my son's father said he was the first time. You know what I'm saying? Because I probably would have had my own place. I would have been there over a year already. And I, you know, I would have been settled. Um, so right. this time I did go back with a, a heavier heart in that sense. Um, um, regarding that, it wasn't harder. I just knew, or I, or I should say that I know what I need to do. Um, so right now, the only frustrating part of this experience is that because I'm a case manager and the, phys- the facility that I, I reside at um, is a small facility, um, I am pretty much my own case manager. Um, so I have to, along with advocating for myself, I still have to physically do certain things. So when you enter shelter um, and you do your intake, you, within the first, because you get your decision from PATH within the first 10 to 14 days. Um, so within that time, you're meeting, you're doing with your case manager, you're meeting your CCC, making appointments, whether you have to get a residence letter to go to PA to open up a case, because that's how they get paid, um, whether you're working or not. Um, all these things have to happen. So I pretty much had to do my own paperwork and then email it to my case manager. Um, my home, my homeless housing application that every person entering shelter fills out. Um, that's how they get picked for HPD lotteries and things of that nature. Later down the line, um, I had to fill out my own application, sign my own 137, email it to her like, hey, please send this in. Um, and that to me is- I have a question before you continue. Is it because of Corona that's happening or is it because the facility is so small they don't have people working there? No, well, because of Corona, things have slowed down in general. But I just feel that's just because it's a small facility and that's how they operate. Um, prime example today, when we're finished, I am headed there to sit with their housing coordinator to train him on how to enter emergency housing voucher re- referrals for his clients. Um, so that's you know, crazy. That is. I mean, crazy. it is crazy, but it at the same time, you know, me doing this for me is going to help him get it together for the people that's there. You know what I'm saying? Hopefully that'll help somebody there. So it is crazy in the sense that it's ridiculous that I should have to do this. My problem, but, you know, um, yeah, continue. Yeah, but I mean, sometimes, you know, is the things you got to do to get what you need that, you know, you just got to get it done. There's just no way around it. My thing is that the rate of turnover for people who work in a shelter is very high. I was in a shelter and I had a couple of, um, Housing specialist. Probably had like three within. And I had I had years. a couple of directors. Like I had about two when I was there. And then I had um case managers. Like they, they the turnover is too fast. That's why people are not learning the things you know properly. Because it's like if we're both it's, new, I can't teach you nothing. <laughs> well, you know what it is. It's not that the turnover is fast because of the learn. It, the turnover is fast because this the same way people enter and exit shelter because of the trauma, like you enter shelter due to a traumatic experience, whether it's a DV experience, whether it's just, you know, family member kicking you out over disagreement or losing your job and can't afford the rent for, you know, that'll be eviction. There's many things and most of those experiences are not positive experiences. Um, So clients come in traumatic, you know, traumatized. And then people who are working um, trying to help people through these traumatic experiences, you know, they they kind of take on a little bit of it, you know. So you get burnt out after a while. Um, you know, it's frustrating because when you're working with some of the clients, you know, they are comfortable being in shelter. 
Some of them are. Some of them have been there before even the, the case manager gets there. They've been there for two, three years. And they'll tell you straight up when you walk in the door and sit down and say, hey, I'm your case manager. You know, I just got here. I just want to introduce myself. They'd be like, all right, well, I'm going to let you know this. And and that's it because you like my fourth case manager in like two years, in like three months. And, you know, um, I don't know, but, you know, that's how they carry on. So they're already here meeting you with this, you know, understanding that I've been here for about nine months. You're my second case manager. I haven't been really getting any help. And, you know, so what, do you, what, what are you going to tell me? So dealing with that, you have to break down that barrier. It is frustrating, you know? The place, the way I work now, I've only been there for about a year. And I have a client who has been there for um, 2017. And she straight up told oh, me, wow. she said, I'm not taking any apartment that they trying to give me in this borough because y'all send people outside and they end up right back here. And I do agree to a certain extent. Um, I personally sat my PD down this week and told her that it needs to be more than just get a job and get an apartment and get out. You understand? Because getting a job is not going to fix a lot of the things that people are dealing with on a day-to-day -day that causes them to be in shelter. And not all the time is it about money because you got people that are working who have money saved up and still in shelter for three and four years. Right. You know, what's the reason for that? So there is a certain, you know, level of therapeutic services that clients do need and they need to be provided on more than just a grant by grant basis. It needs to be just as mandatory as case management. Because if you're not solving the problem that has someone entering shelter, they're going to keep re-entering. It's going to be that revolving door because we're not treating the problem. That is so true. So let's get back to your story. You said after you're basically helping, when you first got in, you first, you did your own paperwork, you did it, things like that. What was next? How did it, how was the people around you? How were the workers towards you? The ones that you did see and things like that? Um, well, the director and I are really good. Um, I call him every now and then. He's like, you know, hey, Ms. Crawford, what's going on? Um, my case manager actually just went out on maternity leave. Um, so let's we'll see who my my next case manager is going to be. <laughs> um, the workers in the building, for the most part, you know, they're okay. But the thing is that it's a, like I told you before, it's a small facility. So they know who I am. So when I say good morning, I get a good morning. When I speak to them and I ask for something, I'm promptly, you know, catered to. It shouldn't be like that, but, you know. I think I'm just, I don't want to say that it like that, but I'm, for now I'm throwing it, I'm taking advantage of throwing my weight around. You know what I mean? Because if that's what I got to do to get the help that I need, then that's what's going to have to happen. So you do, you think that you are treated better because of who you are and what you know already? Um, not better, but differently. Okay. Because, um, of the, yeah, I, I absolutely do feel that I'm treated differently not better because of the knowledge that I have and the way I'm able to advocate for myself, you know, because of what I know. Um, I feel that clients who, who come in and they don't know what's going on, you could tell them anything, you know what I'm saying? You could lead them in any direction because they're just, they're looking for direction. So wherever you point them to, they're right, that sounds good. That's what I'm gonna do because, you know, that might get me to where I wanna be, but that may not necessarily be the case. If you could change something about your experience or about shelter or about even coming into shelter, what would that one thing or two things be? Um, the process would definitely need to change as far as I say the process and I mean everything from your path experience to even your first, your conditional experience at the shelter um, would need to change. I think that 
and this is the thing. I think it always happens this way that the people who are up in who are at the top making the decisions and just, you know, delegating these responsibilities, they need to come to the front lines and see what it is actually like to experience it. You know? So I think that that, that that needs to change. The process needs to change, definitely. And the services, as much as there are many services out there, the access to them um, is limited. And the requirements are limit are are the expect you know like to get into these programs and to qualify, it's it's too um it's too strict and it needs to be broadened. Um, for example, like for myself, they want you to move out of shelter and they're forcing you to take soda, but the city feps I make a little bit too much, and I feel like even if I did make a little bit too much, I'm a working client. You should be helping me, you know, instead of just handing an apartment to the person that's not working for the past four, four or five years. Hi, it's me in the future. So I hope you're enjoying these episodes. Um, if you want to contact us, you can do Twitter or Instagram. I'm on, basically on there all the time. Or I'll just get it to my phone and I'll be able to answer any questions that you have. And anything I don't have the answer for, I will definitely get the information for for you. Um, so this is part one. I hope you enjoy and come back next week for part two. Okay, see you next time.